Okay, so bleeding, we're covered with, then we might cover little, little soft tissues. Again, vocabulary is very important because it, it's just all about vocabulary. Bleeding uh, is, like we talked about the other class, bleeding is C, it's, it's controlled in your primary survey. Make sure as you're doing your patient assessment, you look for uh, out of control bleeding, uh, profuse bleeding. Soft tissue injuries that we'll get to in a minute are going to be more in your secondary uh, assessment as you do your as you do your physical exam. And we always treat for shock. Okay, uh, one, it's on the skill sheet. The patient, your trauma assessment. The patient is they're going to be in shock because you need to get that point. Right, they're going to need oxygen in your patient assessment because there's a point value there. Uh, they have to give you that scenario because there's a point value there, right? If they don't, then they take away, they automatically take away that point away from you. But even in real life, we always treat for shock. Look, look for uh, shock always, okay? We, without saying we would use standard precautions, sometimes more, we need, might need a face shield glasses uh, some of the fire departments now have went through all the, all their calls they're wearing safety glasses uh, to prevent uh, contact bodily fluid contact with with the eyes okay but we would always wear uh, our gloves or standard precautions okay they get bloody right trauma woohoo blood blood and guts gore yeah gotta love it I do so uh, you would have your gloves on. Obviously, when we talk about these spatial bleeding, head injury type things, external soft tissue stuff, they bleed a lot. So uh, controlling the bleeding sometimes is difficult on the head. When you're doing, doing your general impression and your size up on this, you want to look and try to estimate the amount of blood loss. Uh, you do this because later there's a chart that shows you what class of shock they could be in. You don't need to memorize that. You just need to look for signs and symptoms of shock. Okay, nobody in the world says, oh, this patient's in the fourth class of shock or whatever. They look for the signs and symptoms. They treat signs and symptoms. Okay, there's some things that could be, that would accelerate blood loss, pre-existing conditions, like if the patient's on blood thinners or something, they're going to bleed a lot. All right. Maybe it's associated with the fracture. The fracture has lacerated a big vessel. Uh, uh, the patient's age, but again, we assess by looking at signs and symptoms, right? like everything, all the medical emergencies, everything else. We look for the, the signs and symptoms. But we do want to estimate the, the blood loss. Uh, it's hard to estimate the blood loss. If you look at a Coke bottle, a 20 ounce coke that's 500 and something milliliters just a little over 500 milliliters okay uh, that's when the first signs of shock start showing up it's about 500 milliliters of blood loss so if you see five if you see a coke bottle full of blood on the on the ground uh, then you can start estimating yeah this patient's going going to be in shock their first sort of symptoms of shock that sustained tachycardia remember that the first sign of shock is going to be that the body's going to raise the heart rate. They're going to have a sustained tachycardia. Uh, so that began around 500 milliliters or so. And then this this crazy chart with the arrows is just showing you the different classes of shock. I would look it over, you know, but not necessarily. We'll talk about pulse pressure and narrowing pulse pressures here in a minute, okay? But Three types of bleeding. Uh, we, we already know how to stop the bleeding, right? How do we do that? What's the best way to stop bleeding? Direct pressure. Direct pressure. Hopefully, by your age, you know that. Put, put some pressure on it, direct pressure, right? We have, we'll start with the most serious arterial bleeding, okay? It's bright red, it, the appearance is bright red in color. It's pulsating because it's out of an artery, so every time the heart contracts, it spurts blood out cool looking uh, it, you know this is when you have to be careful because it, it literally spurts blood out and 
uh, it can go a long way. I had an arterial. This guy pricked my finger one time to do a. We were outside. Gotta explain it. We this in a minute. But we were outside. He pricked my finger and he hit an arterial, the mm-hmm. small artery, right? And it was so cool. I would hit. I could hit that wall with it. It, it would every time my heart beat. Like, I'm like, oh, this is too cool. So I went out and I did the little uh, sprinkler thing. You know, outside, I'm sitting there going, boom, boom, shh, boom, shh, shh. Spray blood all over the dirt, you know. It was, it was pretty cool. Then did one of these, and like, hmm, hmm. Stop the bleeding. Well, that's an arterial. It doesn't take much to stop the bleeding, but it would, it would spurt a long way. All right? So that's what we have to look for. One thing with an arterial bleed is the direct pressure that you're going to have is going to be more lengthy, okay? So you might be looking at 15 minutes of good direct pressure there or a tourniquet. Right? So when we get to treatment, you might you might probably just put a tourniquet on it, right? If you can't get it stopped with direct pressure. In 24 years, I've only put maybe four or five tourniquets on, very few. Direct pressure seems to always work, okay? So the, uh, some things have changed in, in tourniquet care that we'll talk about in a minute, but even with arterial bleeds, direct pressure most of the time worked unless the patient didn't have good clotting factors. They, they didn't clot well, then, that, then that, was, that was a problem. More common type of bleeding is venous bleeding, sort of a darker red, sort of steady flow out of it. Uh, Again, direct pressure is probably the best answer for that. And then you have capillary bleeding, which is sort of an ooze. It, and it's a mixture. It's sort of a pink stuff. You know, it's the ones you get when you scrape your knee or something. It sort of has a little blood in it and then more interstitial fluid than blood. So it just nobody's going to die. You don't have to put a tourniquet on with capillary bleeding. Uh, it's going to clot really quick. You do want to cover the wound, but no no fear of going into shock with capillary bleeding. Venous bleeding just in arterial, yes, depending on the size of the vessel. So just remember the characteristics and uh, the treatment, direct pressure, direct, direct pressure, pressure dressing, tourniquet, right? We get to tourniquet pretty quick. So one thing that's probably new to use these topical hemos static agents um, and uh, we'll look at a picture here in just a second but these are the methods for controlling the external bleeding and so what we would do is we'd apply direct pressure and then uh, we would put a pressure dressing on it so we would put a 4x4 four four over the wound and then wrap it with cling right? 4 or 6 inch cling or wrap it with something and wrap it sort of tight so that pressure dressing is holding direct pressure on there. That way you don't have to sit there and hold direct pressure. Put that sterile four by four over the wound, wrap it, okay? If that doesn't work, okay, uh, according to your skill sheet, then you would apply the tourniquet, okay? According to common sense, unless it's just a massive bleed, like you know this is not going to start, stop, you would put another dressing on top and then try to wrap it again and put more direct pressure on there, okay? Uh, your National Registry skill sheet wants you to go directly to a tourniquet, which is okay in the grand scheme of things, but we can use a little common sense. Some of these wounds will soak through, and so we'll put another pressure dressing over the top, and if it soaks through that, then we'll go to a tourniquet. But this is all in a matter of just a couple minutes, okay? But if you have this guy that, you know, uh, he sliced his femoral artery open, tourniquet time, right? Put some direct pressure on it until you can get your tourniquet out of your bag and then put the tourniquet on there, okay? So anyway, uh, it's, it's pretty more common sense. If you can't use a tourniquet, then you if 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 you have the hemostatic agent, which is uh, one brand name is Quick Clot, 
okay? It's just a brand name, okay? Uh, you can put this on, on there as well. So those are sort of methods, and it's very quick, okay? The other method that will help control the bleeding is splinting. So if you have a fracture, it, uh, you can splint it. Typically, you're, you're not to put uh, a tourniquet over a fracture, but if the, if it's the patient's bleeding to death, then you might have to have a tourniquet. I've had to do that before. The patient was just bleeding out right in front of it, so I had to go ahead and put a tourniquet uh, in the same area as the fracture so the, uh, to get the bleeding under control. So you have a nice big uh, wound there. Right? So you could take your 4x4 four four and start putting direct pressure on it. If you... and someone's grabbing your 4x4 four four and blood squirting out, then your gloved hand, you can put your gloved hand in there and put pressure on where it's bleeding from, okay? Until you get your 4x4, four four, then you can stick your 4x4 four four back in there. Uh, if it's a large wound, like this one, a large sort of gaping wound, what they're teaching now and have been for some time is to pack the wound, okay? That's more of a protocol issue. Uh, they have classics out there, it's called Stop the Bleed, and uh, the American Heart Association put on these classes, and uh, they recommend packing the wound, okay? But more of a protocol issue, you may not, different places may not have that training yet, most everybody does, so you would take your gauze, like a, this is just, they call it combat gauze, but it's just roller gauze, right? And you pack the wound with that, in, in these big gaping wounds. Okay, to help control the bleeding, and then you would put a pressure dressing around that once you once you pack the wound. Okay. Tourniquets. There's a couple different types of tourniquets uh, that we use. Just to give you a little history of tourniquets, back before uh, the Iraqi War started, when Sometime, some, sometime in that time frame, it was the, the teaching thought was, and everybody's thought was, once you put a tourniquet on, you sacrifice the limb. But it's always life over limb. So uh, once you put the tourniquet on, they said that you sacrifice the limb. That, that was the way it was for 20 years, okay? Plus, plus, okay? Now, uh, and I was reminded in, the, in a class, actually, we were talking about this, and, and I said, no, 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 they, thanks to the war, we learned all our new trauma stuff in, due to war. All right, that's, that's primarily where, where we learned tra uh, trauma at. And so what they did was they, uh, on the battlefield, they had to put these tourniquets on, but they couldn't get the patient away from where they were, and the guy was telling me they they lasted up to uh, 48 hours with the tourniquet on. They took the tourniquet off and reperfused the limb, and there was no damage to the limb. Okay, so there's been some change in the teaching standard, really, in the use of tourniquets. Where once we thought that it caused permanent damage because a tourniquet will cut blood flow off. Okay, once you place a tourniquet on, it's going to stop bleeding because there's no blood flow. You, you, uh, you completely clamp the blood flow off, so you thought, oh, that limb is gone. Obviously, you only put a tourniquet over a limb, right? But uh, most of the time, so they thought it was gone, and hey, we found out that, no, they can last quite a while with, uh, with the tourniquet on. So this is one type of tourniquet. There's like a gazillion out there. I seen one the other day that was, it looked like a big zip tie that you could reuse. It has a, it had a little thing that you could push it and pull it. Then if you wanted to release it, you could push that a button and it would release. And it would, would also mark the time that the tourniquet was in place. Uh, these are the ones that are around in this area. It's called a cat. I say it's called a cat tourniquet, but that would repeat the T twice, because the T on the end of the cat is for tourniquet. It's called a combat action tourniquet, 
These are what everybody carries, police officers carry them. You'll see some police officers carrying these on their, uh, on their duty belt, okay? Uh, there was an incident oh, a few years back in Arlington where a police officer got shot and he got shot in the leg and hit his femoral artery. Uh, his partner uh, took care of the, of the shooter and then put a tourniquet on his partner, saved his life, all right there, I believe, on the front porch. Uh, whoever it was shot the police officer, the other police officer shot him and then put the tourniquet on his partner. Uh, so, very quick, it, a lot of people carry them, uh, and they're, they're doing the Velcro, and then this little twisting bar here. Uh, this is what tightens up the tourniquet, uh, we won't practice putting tourniquets on each other, but we use Steve, okay, or Frank, one of the two. I, I actually tie it out. Yeah. Well, if, if, you, if you put it on to tie it, it's hard. Yeah, then you shouldn't put it on. It's not something that you practice, okay? But one one side note to this is this is uh, sort of this fabric will get wet, and then it will loosen up some. So if, if the patient starts to bleed again, you would just have to tighten the tourniquet back down to that, another notch. It twists, it twists around, and then the once you get it tight enough, you put the bar in this here, and then put it over and write the time. The time is very important when you actually put the tourniquet on, okay? Keep in mind that you can use anything almost for a tourniquet, a blood pressure cuff, a belt. Uh, uh, this guy, Motorcycle rider turned in front of a car, car hit him, it amputated his leg just right above the knee. He, he would have been DRT, except that uh, a Boy Scout grabbed some wire and a couple of sticks and wrapped the wire around his femoral. And when we got there, two guys were pulling on the wire against each other, holding the tourniquet. And uh, we was like, we got there and they almost let go and we go, oh, no, no, don't, don't let go. Took our tourniquet, put it on there. Unfortunately, the guy bled, he had something up here wrong. He couldn't get, we couldn't oxygenate him very well. And uh, he, he ended up dying. But if, if the Boy Scout wouldn't put the tourniquet on, then uh, he would have died before we got there. So anyway, this is, we're practice putting this on the cat. Wow. You know. Okay. So you see this, he's got a big femoral bleed there. You put the tourniquet on. Look in your book on how many inches above the wound. I keep I keep forgetting. It's just a couple inches above the wound. Okay. But that's always a good test question of how many inches above the wound do you place a tourniquet? Uh, four. Four? Is it four? Okay. Well let's see that. Well, I was wrong. Down where? So four inches. Put the tourniquet on, and then twist the bar, and then note the time. Just like I said, don't put it over a joint, okay? Uh, proximal to the wound, but not over a joint, just uh, distal to a joint, or proximal to a joint, depending on where the wound is. But then turn the bar. When will you know that you have it tied enough? Bleeding stops. Bleeding stops. Bleeding will stop when when you have it tied enough because you cut off blood flow to the extremity. Okay. Wrap right there. Put the uh, put the time on it. This tourniquet is this junctional tourniquet. This is not approved yet. This is something that they use only on a on uh, the battlefield essentially. For right now, uh, it will eventually be approved. Some EMS agencies use the hemostatic stuff. Uh, it's been out since the early 90s. The hemostatic uh, compound or the quick clock type stuff. But this this is for this like this gaping wound here. So if you didn't have this special tourniquet, what would you do here with that big hole? Pack it, pack it, wrap it. Pressure, a lot of direct pressure, right? Treat for shock, definitely. Uh, so these are not, these junctional bleeding things, 
what's it called again? J special junctional tourniquet. They're not used yet for EMS. Uh, a lot of things that drive EMS is the cost, and that was the thing with quick clot, is it was costly. So uh, I don't think not too many people picked up on it because it was, it was pretty costly when the majority of it was uh, let me stop direct pressure in, in a tourniquet. Okay. But it, it does it does work well. Splinting, like we said, if you have a fracture, you can imagine the two bones in there if you don't splint it by fractures. You're, you're moving this fracture and it's continuing to cut tissue up and continuing to bleed, right? Splint that in place and then that way uh, it will also help control the bleeding. But don't delay over the splint. I've taken many patients into the ED before with bones sticking out and fractures without splints on them because there's other problems, airway problems, right? And other problems that uh, we're trying to overcome. We'll talk about a traction splint later. That It only has one purpose, uh, a closed mid-shaft femur fracture, and most people don't even use them anymore. So we'll speak to that in a minute. These hemostatic uh, agents, direct pressure, if you get this direct, direct pressure, you have that big hole in that guy's chest, you can drop some quick clot or something, you can drop this powder in there. Uh, what it does and how it works is that it works off, essentially it cauterizes the wound. So the vessels inside of there, it burns them shut. First generation stuff here, it, uh, you put it on there and it would cause third, third degree burns. It burns so bad. Uh, I would still rather have a third degree burn than bleed death. Okay? They fixed it, they fixed it, they generation, you know, 5.0 or whatever, and it got out where it's not, it wouldn't burn them so bad, but then they had problems with it once they washed it or uh, clean, cleansed the wound, uh, the patient would start bleeding again. And so the, uh, but now they have them out there where they, they just clot that up. You can actually pick the clot up out of the, out of the wound. It looks like Jello, you know, the other way. They, very good agent. Did, did we watch that last year with the pig? Did we get to that? No. Um, no. I have a cool video where they kept this little piggy open and dumped this in. Then they even moved his feet around and. Sealed the clot. It, it, uh, it uh, cauterized it really good. <laughs> One thing I wish we could do, of course, they wouldn't let us dissect the frog, a live frog, and watch it heart beat. But the, uh, you know how the military does this class here? If you're in the military, uh, like, you know, you're don't be a combat medic or whatever. You, you know how they do this bleeding class? They don't cut you. Oh, they don't cut you. That's, that's insane. They just got someone from the enemy side. Yeah. 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 They, they go get Gary the goat. They have a pet goat. And they they have this class and we say, are there any questions? Any questions? No? Let's go out back. Come on, Gary. Uh, how do you make a goat sound? Huh? Make a goat. Bah. 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 Oh, no. bah. Okay. Sheep, whatever. Okay. Not good with animal sounds. So, goat, 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 goat. Right? They, they take Gary outside. Everybody's standing around. And he said, Your group's up here. You're going to control the bleeding. Right? Uh uh. Pulls out their uh, nine millimeter. <laughs> Don't let them die. <laughs> Guess what happens if Gary dies? You fail. If Gary dies, you fail. So they shoot him in a non-critical area where you just want like one like go to go to heaven right away. You know, it's like, uh, but the uh, shoot him in the hip or something, and uh, they fix him up. Next group. Next group. Oh, that's so sad. Hey, Greg. Don't worry. 
at the end of class, you know what they do to the goat? They eat it. They make the heat is out of it. That's not bad. Mm-hmm. If it's cooked right. If it's cooked wrong, then it, it's nasty. Hey, but, uh, so they open it up. They pour it in there. Uh, it comes in all different forms now. It comes in the powder form. Uh, you, you can actually buy this. You can go to Gall's or whatever, uh, a medical store, and buy quick clot. It comes in uh, like rhino plugs. You can take them and put them up the nose, and that would really seem like it would burn, but it comes in four by fours and in all different tops, and then the powder, powder form as, as well. And then it's like this. You would, this is not in powder form, but you would start packing, and then when, I guess once it got combined with the bud, it, it would warm up somewhat. Okay, but most times it's it's the powder form. Okay, so just like any other call, you do a good size up, good general impression. Look for mechanism of injury, right number of patients, additional resources. This should sound familiar because it's going down your skill sheet. Okay. Uh, do your primary assessment. Even in trauma, you would evaluate the need for oxygen, okay? Uh, like I said, on your skills, though, so you're going to put oxygen on the patient, the patient's going to be in shock because of the point system, so anticipate that, okay? And then control the bleeding. Very important, because I put it in bold letters, okay? But it is, it's, especially in real life, don't get distracted from the big injuries, okay? What will happen a lot of times, you'll walk up to a big trauma, maybe somebody's been injected or something out there and they're all broken up, there's bones sticking out everywhere, both of his femurs are sticking out through his legs. Uh, you know, he has these gaping wounds all over his body and, and you get distracted with that and not realize that the patient's not breathing. Okay, so still, CAB, hold their C-spine, make sure that they're breathing. C, circulation, make sure that those big gaping wounds are not going to kill him right away or the patient right away. Control the bleeding, right? But, uh, and do it in a rapid movement. But don't get distracted. I've seen this in real life and it's, uh, it, it happens, okay? And then resources get diverted and people end up dying from it because people, you get tunnel vision or the provider got tunnel vision and, uh, <clears throat> you know, other, other people died from it. So don't get distracted from these big injuries. We'll look at some fractures, some pictures of fractures later and in injuries and sort of go through them. It's like, yeah, they look bad, but they're not really that bad, right? Okay, I mean, you can, you can lose a lot of blood in a femur fracture and everything, but... Uh, it's more important to breathe. Uh, most time, their fractures don't bleed a, a lot unless they did uh, nick an artery or whatever. Always in trauma, rapid assessment. So you go down through and very quickly, significant bleeding, ultra mental status. Does he have other injuries? You know, was the patient ejected? Do they have a significant mechanism of injury that we, we have to consider, right? And then consider other things as we go through. Good, get a good set of baseline vital signs, especially the pulse. Uh, remember that even in a trauma patient, the, the pressure is going to be the last thing to sort of drop. Uh, hemorrhagic shock or hypovolemic shock. Uh, the body's going to try to maintain a pressure by increasing the heart rate, vasoconstricting. Okay, so keep that in mind. And then look, hypoperfusion, are they pale, cold, clammy? Uh, uh, their pressure starting to drop, those different things. Keep the pulse ox above 95%. Always treat for shock. And then whatever method that we look at, controlling direct pressure. If they have extremity uh, fractures, then, then splint the extremities. Keep reassessing trauma patients. You would reassess every five minutes because of the fact that they could uh, go downhill pretty quick, right? Especially maybe you, you fixed everything on the outside and then they may have internal bleeding. So that's a problem. So keep reassessing 
right? Some other things that may not be as bad, a nosebleed, even though I've seen a, a person have a nosebleed uh, from hypertension that uh, was, was putting him into sort of the first stage of shock, but digital trauma just always cracks me up. You know what digital trauma to the nose is? Oh, to the nose? Somebody picking his nose and having a wreck or something. You know, they're driving down the road. You seen that guy driving around, he's picking his nose. Whoops! Oh, that's a thing. I can't get it out. It won't come out. We're going to have to cut it off. Hypertension, esophageal varices, clotting problems, sinus problems. Skull or facial trauma, we'll get into that. We have a whole chapter over it. But facial injuries bleed like really bad, okay? Head injuries that are bleeding, okay? Uh, if you have bleeding from the, from the, not the ear or the nose, <clears throat> but from the ear or the nose, and you believe that there's a head injury, <clears throat> don't stop the bleeding. Don't try to pack that and stop the bleeding. That's sort of a pressure valve. It's allowing pressure to, like if they have the base of their skull fractured and they're bleeding from, from the ear, not the ear bleeding, but from the ear, let it bleed. Because it's just a pressure valve let, letting blood out, okay? So this weird word here is a nosebleed. Everybody calls it nosebleed unless you want to impress somebody with a big word. Epitaxis, right? Epistaxis. F or something, but it's a nosebleed. A lot of times, people, you get nosebleeds where uh, if your auntie want to lean their head back, right? And now you get the call, and they, they, first it was a nosebleed, now they're vomiting blood before you get there. Well, of course, they're vomiting blood because you know their nose back, it went down the pharynx, they swallowed it. The stomach does not like blood, it's going to vomit it back up, but it's from the nosebleed. It's not like a anything serious. Lean them forward, put direct pressure uh, on their nose. Uh, some people have a little thing like this to put on top of the nose, okay? <laughs> if it was red, I could be Rudolph. Huh? Blanket. Okay. Anyway, little nose clamp. Uh, they may do like a rhino plug. It uh, it uh, looks like a small tampon actually. You, and they shove it up their nose. It expands out and stops the stops the bleeding. Okay. Uh, you might have that the rhino plug, the packing there, and uh, you could put some ice on the bridge to sort of vasoconstrict if you wanted to. But anyway, a nosebleed just don't lean their head backwards. Okay. Otherwise, external bleeding is fairly, fairly easy to control. Okay. Uh, you have a lot of different methods: direct pressure, uh, quick clot, tourniquet, right? more direct pressure. Uh, internal bleeding, however, is not as as easy. It, you can't control it really, and uh, they can bleed internally really quick. Internal bleeding in the pelvis, like a pelvic fracture, the patient can lose half their blood volume in their pelvis. 3,000 cc's of blood in their pelvis. Right? A femur fracture, you can lose up to a, a liter of blood in the femur from a femur fracture. Okay? And so uh, it could be rather dramatic. So as you would hear, internal bleeding, you would look for the signs and symptoms, the same as external bleeding. Bleeding's bleeding, right? So one thing that you would look at is a sustained tachycardia, okay? Do they have a sustained tachycardia? They could have, back to the vocabulary again, they could have this hematoma, right? I, there's a picture coming up, picture's worth a thousand words, but a hematoma is that collection of blood underneath the skin, it sort of swells up. Have you ever seen anybody with, uh, Especially kids, you know, they're swinging. Maybe you, they swing, they fall, they sort of hit their head off with something, and this big old pocket of fluid sort of 
mounds up right there on their head, right? If it's clear fluid, then it's just fluid. If there's blood in it, then it's a hematoma. So that's why the hematoma is just a collection of it. There's some very large hematomas that could actually put the patient into shock. All right, so, you know, that's one sign. If it's a long-term internal bleed, they could have st they could have start showing bruising. Uh, maybe over with this with the spleen is they could have bruising, but that would take a while for that to go through the skin. Okay. We remember this little mnemonic or whatever DCAT BTLS. We went over that during uh, trauma, right? Assessment. What is it? Deformity, contusions, abrasions, punctures, burns. You're right. Tenderness. L. Laceration. S. <laughs> Swell. Swelling. Swelling. There we go. Yeah. Deformities, contusions, abrasions, punctures, burns, tenderness, laceration, swelling. Okay? So we look for DCAP, BTLS. Other things that we would look for uh, bleeding, vomiting blood, hematemesis, right? Bright red blood. Uh, coffee ground emesis, which would it uh, it looks like if coffee ground emesis, if you took coffee grounds, which you know now that we have courage, we don't have coffee grounds anymore. So coffee grounds, and you mix it with water, and you throw it on the ground, that would be coffee ground emesis. It, it looks just like coffee grounds. Okay, coffee ground emesis is partially digested blood. Okay, and then of course hypotension, but narrowing pulse pressures, what you you have narrowing pulse pressures are that where the diastolic and systolic pressures close together. So as you're doing your vital signs every five minutes, you know narrowing pulse pressures. You know that the systolic and diastolic pressures are coming closer and closer together. That's what narrowing pulse pressures are. It's very important to remember. That's on your trauma test. Okay? So make sure that you, uh, and it's probably on the National Registry, it's a sign that there's, they're going into shock, they're in shock, or they, they're the bleeds, right? Maybe in, internal bleeding. So we would look for that as well. Keep an eye on it. Anxiety, restlessness, not getting enough oxygen, uh, swelling, like, gastric distension, you know, you, you picked up this patient and they've had a flat belly when you picked them up and then a couple minutes later they have that, that big old round watermelon belly. Tap on it, it's burned, you go, ooh, you're bleeding inside, right? It's probably fatal, it's probably leaky in the water or something, so they're bleeding inside. So watch, watch for that. The tachycardia comes from the shock, dip, increased respiratory rate, difficulty breathing, right? So we look for these different signs and symptoms that would that would lead us when we're talking about trauma, maybe, maybe they have an internal bleed. This is where mechanism of injury comes into play as well. Study the mechanism of injury. Hey, you know, what's, do they have a possibility of internal bleeding? Let's say, for instance, somebody, I'm playing a slow round of golf, okay, and uh, this person, not mentioning any names, that would play faster than me, she keeps hitting up on me. Man, I'm already having a bad day at it, right? I mean, I'm already, like, just a bad day of golf. It's still better than a good day of work, but anyway, uh, I'm, I'm still having a, I'm having a bad day, and they keep hitting up on me. I was like, I'm having nothing. So I, I start walking back towards them with my three iron that I never use, 
And uh, I said, you're not going to hit up on me anymore. And I whack him right in the abdomen, all right? <laughs> Knocks him over. I said, I bet you won't do that again. And go and finish my miserable game of golf, right? So someone calls 911 and they're going, some crazy bald man hit the person in the belly with the golf club, right? That's significant mechanism of injury, right? I've been hit I've, I've been injured yeah. by blunt trauma. Blunt, blunt force trauma, significant. Especially if I was aiming and trying to get up underneath it with the, the liver, right? I'm going, I'm going for the gold. I'm going like up underneath the rib cage, hit that liver. Okay. Anyway, that's blunt force trauma, so that would be significant, correct? You would suspect internal bleeding from there, so that would that would come up. Yeah, that would be significant enough to uh, cause that. And so you're you're getting the report from the from the witnesses, and they go, yeah, and the crazy guy stole her cowlers, too. I don't understand it. Well, you better find him. So, watch, watch for that, right? <laughs> Let me know. <clears throat> I've only had that happen once. <laughs> Not that I hit the person with the golf club. <laughs> get out of my way. That's mine. Forget Black Friday. <laughs> the uh, I had this guy hit up on me once. I was having a bad day, and uh, I forget what golf course it was at. But he like came up and it was almost like hitting me. So I turned around and I launched the golf ball back towards him, his golf ball, hit it back at him. <laughs> and uh, then, you know, I'm sitting there going, and he just, like, left me alone after that. But it, it all finished out good. I, I still was terrible at it, and he backed off, so all, everything worked out good. No blunt force trauma. Look, this is why we use uh, warming measures. Lower body temperature will de decrease clotting factors, okay? So we, we need to make them warm. In August, in North Texas, you have a patient, a trauma patient, you cover them with a blanket, you keep them warm, okay? Extra warm. So if we don't, uh, medications will do that. Uh, IV fluids can thin the blood down, so we, we are careful, even though EMT-wise we don't start IVs. We keep removing that dressing and those, those bandages. We don't do that. Once they're on, we, we leave them on, okay? We don't contend about cleaning the wound right then. Let the doctor do that when they can control the bleeding a little bit better, okay? So these are things that can in, increase the bleeding. Review over your notes. We already talked about hemorrhagic shock. All right, so review over that. We're losing blood. We're losing the ability to carry oxygen so the patient can uh, go, go into shock. And we're losing pressure, right? The blood is coming out, so we're losing pressure. And we're losing the ability to carry oxygen. So the, uh, And it does require rec recognition. Okay, the patient's going into shock. If we stick with the premise that we always treat for shock, then we're not going to miss it, right? So, always treat for shock. Now, this the little Johnny who fell down and skinned his knees, we don't have to treat Johnny for shock, right? He has capillary bleeding, he's not going to die. This guy that, uh, or a person that got hit with his three iron, we should probably treat them for shock, okay? Or been in a massive car wreck or, or, or whatever. Always, the, the goggles are a good idea. I can't tell you how many times I've come up with blood splatter on my glasses, okay? And then they go, man, I can't see a thing. What's up? What's up? Oh, okay. Wipe blood off. I've had to go home and change before. 
uh, I've got too much blood on me. And then, uh, so make sure that you're using good, good uh, standard precautions. A side note to that, uh, right out was that, uh, like I did, except for this day, I usually bring two sets of clothes with me. So include socks. You guys are riding out in the cold and, cold and wet, so I bring two, three pair of socks in case your feet get wet, or in case you get wet. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about that later, but trauma-wise, bring, bring in another set of clothes. You never know. Oxygenate them if, if it's indicated. Keep them warm. Right. Recess every five minutes. So, uh, lay them supine. They'll probably be supine anyway, more, more than likely on a backboard. O2 if needed, keep them warm. Rapid transport is always the key uh, in trauma. Any kind of trauma, you want rapid transport. When we're working on our LC ready, I missed this one question because it's just this abdominal evisceration. And the answer was rapid transport. I'm like, that can't be it. I wouldn't rapid transport an abdominal evisceration. evisceration. But they do in the book land. They do in the book. So the trauma is always rapid transport. Okay, even uh, stuff that on the outside world that you wouldn't necessarily do that with. I've had a few eviscerations and it's like, no, no big deal go to the hospital okay but here test test land book land rapid transport we assess every five minutes for, for trauma okay bleeding's pretty easy trauma like I said it's sort of a breath of fresh air after all that medical stuff and, and because it's so easy to understand there's, there's not a lot to do these soft tissue injuries that we're going to talk about after break for a few minutes, we're going to look at the definitions. Uh, you would do the same thing, treat for shock, okay? Cover the wound, or control the bleeding, stop the bleeding, cover the wound, treat for shock, rapid transport. Uh, it, it may just repeats itself over and over. Uh, 